Well, good evening. We do have a, I believe, wonderful evening. I, I always look forward uh, to this time. There is such a work in the people of God that is accomplished through uh, communion, through remembrance, through examination, through all that is given to us. Uh, our title tonight is Christ Crucified, the Father Satisfied. We've seen a little bit of that. We sang about that this evening. We have seen that uh, explicitly worded in Isaiah 53, as Brian has read uh, that wonderful scripture for us this evening. And, and as we prepare this evening, uh, I was coming out of this morning. We are in Hebrews chapter 5. We're, we're learning truths that are foreign to our ears often about priests, their function, uh, the high priest, his role. And I want to continue in that vein this evening. We're going to be kind of all over the book of Hebrews and in the Old Testament. And so if you want to, you can go ahead and turn to Hebrews 5. We're going to look briefly at a verse we closed with this morning and continue forward in that area. But what I want to look at is a very important foundation to our faith, a right understanding of, of Christ crucified. The foundation for that, what pointed to that? What was the necessity that demanded a bloody sacrifice such as the cross itself uh, brought forth? And so we're going to look at a foundation, the sacrificial requirement of our God. What, what was it in the law that demanded this? And this, like the priesthood, I'm afraid, often gets passed over for multiple reasons in a righteous way. Well, because Jesus has fulfilled it. I don't have to consider offering a bull or a goat or a lamb or a pigeon or, or other things. I don't have to make atonement. And so we rejoice in that. But I'm, I'm afraid that oftentimes we do so to the neglect of the clearest picture possible of what it was that Christ did at the cross. That when we gather to participate in the Lord's table together in remembrance of his body broken... And his blood shed. That without a, a right view of what has been given to us in the Old Testament as profitable. That we might know these truths. Even having never participated in them. That not having to participate in them would bring forth a greater rejoicing. Because this oftentimes gets passed over. In my mind, I've never participated in nor have I had to praise Jesus for that. The law of God and the sacrificial system, the requirements of it. Because it's a foundation that points us to Christ. I, I want us to, to consider it this evening. It has been recorded, it has been preserved by God for our profitability. Now, as I'm looking ahead to the next admonition to come in our study of Hebrews chapter 5. I, I referenced it this morning and we won't be there for a few weeks as we're going to be taking a break from our exposition to go into preparation for our missions conference next week and then our actual missions conference the week after that. Uh, so we'll be getting back to this, but this is what's coming next. And I, I recognize the application uh, in, in, in our world, in this generation, but how much does it apply to us here at Community Baptist Church. Consider these words in verses 13 and 14 of Hebrews chapter 5. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Now, as we're gathered here this evening, my, my expectation is that each of us who are here have a desire to be mature, to be trained in our discernment, our avoidance, our recognition of good and evil, that we would not want to be an infant in our understanding and our thinking and our praise and our worship and our lives and in all that we are, that we would want to be those who enjoy meat, who are accustomed to these things. And, and one of the things that I would say is if we're passing over what are the foundations that brought us to where we're at, can we truly ever arrive at the maturity, the understanding, the knowledge, the fullness of the stature of Christ who became that sacrifice, who fulfilled that law, who is even now our high priest? And my answer would be no. We must 
labor to the knowledge and understanding of them so that we might grow in greater and greater maturity in our knowledge of him who satisfied him to whom those things were but a shadowing of and to whom those things pointed to that we even tonight can rejoice. Communion is a time of remembrance of the foundation of our faith that Christ sacrificed uh, his sacrifice brought us justification, adoption, all the many things that we rejoice in. These are, these are foundations that came through that sacrifice. This is a story. I've shared this before, but I want to share it again uh, with you tonight. Just kind of to set the tone for, for where we're going. And it's a story that I read some time ago. It's told of a tiny English chapel whose stone walls were covered over by ivy. And over an arch were inscribed the words, we preach Christ crucified. It's a good foundation for a church. But for many years, a generation of godly men did exactly that. They preached Christ crucified. But times changed. The ivory grew and pretty soon covered the last word. The inscription now read, we preach Christ that just that one word, crucified, was, was gone. And it doesn't maybe seem like a huge deal. We preach Christ. <laughs> Other men came and they did preach Christ. Christ the example, Christ the humanitarian, Christ the ideal teacher. As the years passed, the ivy continued to grow until finally the inscription read, We preach. The generation that came along then did just that. They preached economics, social gospel, book reviews, just about anything that they felt like. And we must never give in to this popular trend and we must always preach Christ crucified. The foundation of who we are. That he died a bloody death crushed by the Father as a substitutionary atonement. Winning propitiation so that he might give to us his righteousness and take from us our deserved punishment. We must never lose these foundations. And there is not a better time to think on this, to remember this, to be reminded of this than in our remembrance of him crucified during our communion service. As I said before, we're, we're going deeply into our study of the priesthood. The, the book of Hebrews demands that. All the way through chapter 9 and even beyond, but specifically through chapter 9, it continually brings us back to an understanding of God's design, is his provision in the priesthood and Christ's fulfillment of that. And so I want to continue that in a little bit of a unique way here in our communion service this evening. And I want to bring clarity to our hearts tonight, even as we partake of the Lord's table, as we have been commanded. This is, this is not simply something we do every five to seven weeks. This is a command from the Lord that is intended to accomplish specific things through the power of the Lord and the Spirit who has been given to us most specifically as we gather as the body of Christ corporately for the observation of this. It's not just something traditionally we do. It is much more than that. Christ on the cross. The description, as we will read and have read and are all familiar with, is he's described as our sacrifice. That Christ was sacrificed at the cross. It was a bloody sacrifice, to be honest and to be exact. And we are distant some 2,000 plus years from all of the bloody sacrifices of the temple worship as commanded by God. We're, we're a little bit sanitized. Hey, we're a little bit uh, cleansed from the realities of what this, in fact, means. What it means that we're gathering even tonight to the remembrance of Christ, our sacrifice, of Christ crucified. It's amazing. When you read the accounts, oftentimes the consideration is in that final moments of Christ's life that are recorded in multiple of the Gospels, most specifically from the upper room in John 13 through the high priestly prayer in John 17, that as they, they travel through the valley from the temple, they cross over. And it's interesting because geographically there would have had to be a bridge because during the time of Passover, the blood flowed so deeply from the temple sacrifices that it created a river that was uncrossable without a bridge to cross over. We don't think like that. And we're not confronted with those things. So we hear about Christ crucified and we sanitize it. 
Maybe we sanitize and remove from our, from our very uh, nice surroundings and our comfortable lives and the things we're pursuing, the realities of our beloved Savior dying a brutal death, suffering under the crushing weight of our sin by the hand of his own father, rejected as the, as the scapegoat that was taken outside the camp to bear the weight of the sins of the people, that he, in fact, is that for me and for you. We need to recognize this more fully that we might see what, what is truly accomplished at the cross, that we might remember, that our remembrance might be full, that it might have its intended work, that it might pierce our hearts, that it might not leave us, oh, that was a wonderful evening. It was nice to see so and so. That was so nice. I love the way we do communion. It's different than where I've done it elsewhere. No. That we might here tonight be reminded personally and intimately of the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, that it might do the work in us that is intended. <clears throat> That work that's intended is, is a work of examination, of purification, of strengthening while looking unto him, the author and finisher of our faith with thanksgiving and worship in our hearts. And I believe it's important to allow the Old Testament to point us there with the law and the demands of the law upon the lives of God's children. Now the Old Testament sacrificial system performed a very specific purpose in first confronting the people with their need or what we would call conviction and then fulfilling their needs so that out of that conviction they might respond with thanksgiving and praise to the fulfillment that God has provided for them. I want to read a lengthy quote that, that tethers uh, both our time in communion and this sacrificial system uh, requirement of the Lord. It's lengthy, so it begins here. Now as Christians, we don't have a sacrificial system anymore and we don't have any thank offerings. They're sometimes called peace offerings. We don't have those kind of offerings anymore. We basically have only one ceremony. We have only one ongoing ceremony, and that is the Lord's table. We don't have ongoing sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, continually pointing to our sinfulness and our need for a Savior. The one sacrifice of Christ eliminated the need for any other sacrifices. But we do still need the constant reminder of our sinfulness. And we need to address that sinfulness. And we need to be brought to penitence and confession of that sinfulness. Now we don't do that by sacrifices. But we do that by remembering the once for all sacrifice. So every time we come to the Lord's table, we are thrown back, as it were, on the sacrifice of Christ. And reminded again of how desperate our sinful condition is. And how glorious was the sacrifice of Christ to provide the sacrifice that satisfied the wrath of God regarding our sin. Remember, that very same Lord's, therefore, that very same Lord's table becomes for us a celebration of gratitude. Remembering how sinful we are causes us to offer up thanks to God. And so the Lord's table is for us the focal point in the church, both of the remembrance of our sin and the expression of our thanks, end quote. And so what I want to do this evening is establish in our time the remembrance so that these two purposes of the Old Testament sacrifice, as I believe they continue forward in our time of communion, might be established. Tonight I want us to be reminded of our sinfulness. It's not a popular topic. It's a necessary topic. It is an absolutely essential aspect of what we are to be thinking on when we consider our Lord crucified. Why was he crucified? For my sin. It was my sin that drove the bitter nails. These are not just words that we sing. These are truths about the foundation of who we are. We need to be reminded of our sinfulness so that we might rejoice in Jesus's provision. Every aspect of what we have in the old covenant and specifically the sacrificial system pointed to Christ. It, too often, though, we receive this truth in a superficial way and we're not brought to the depth of what was intended, what is intended it, to be accomplished for those who practice these things. So I'm going to look at four elements quickly. They'll, they'll be very brief of the Old Testament sacrificial system and how they were pointing to Christ on the cross. And, and this stems out of the high priest role. On the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, when he would go into the Holy of Holies and make atonement for all the people of God. 
This is what he would find in there. It, it dealt with the Ark of the Covenant. On that Ark, we have the mercy seat. It dealt with the blood of the sacrifice, and it dealt with the high priest himself. Now, we've been looking at these things in Leviticus 16. I encourage you, if you have not yet read that chapter, please go at some point this week and read Leviticus 16. To have a little greater grasp and understanding of, of the institution of the Day of Atonement, the, the high priest, and what we're studying in, in Hebrews of Christ's fulfillment of that. When we look at this in, in Hebrews, really chapter 7 through 10, it explains all this in some detail. We're, we're going to be there. Not tonight, but I would encourage you, please be reading ahead in our study of Hebrews. That's, that's where this is coming from. And the first thing we see is in the Holy of Holies, what would the high priest come in contact with? Well, the Ark of the Covenant. And this is intended, in, in case you weren't aware, to bring about the recognition of our sin. Think about this. Listen to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 4. What was in the ark? Well, this is what we're given. Having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold. In which was a golden jar. Inside the ark there's a golden jar holding the manna. And Aaron's rod which budded. And the tables or the tablets of the covenant. The three articles represented some of the most embarrassing and disgraceful events in the history of Israel. These were not there as a, as a reminder of Israel's faithfulness. Quite the opposite. These things represented this. They also represented the faithfulness of God to his people in spite of their unfaithfulness. I mean, think about this, the jar of manna. When we read about the manna that came down and you read about the Israelites during the time of the Exodus, what was their response to God's provision? Grumbling and complaining. A testing of God in these things. Listen to Exodus chapter 16 and verse 32. This is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer or a portion sufficient for one man of manna and keep it for the generations to come so they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt. This is my faithfulness, God's faithfulness on display. Keep this in the ark so that they will know of my provision in generations past. God had provided this food for the Israelites when they grumbled during the wanderings in the desert. It was bread from heaven, literally. <laughs> he continued to provide the food daily and faithfully. But the people were not thankful. Not one bit. They took it for granted. They, they began to grumble continually and wanted something else continually. Continually. The jar of manna was an uncomfortable reminder that despite what God had provided for them, the Israelites were in rejection of God's provision to them. Second, we have Aaron's staff, which budded. And this comes right out of what we were looking at earlier in Numbers chapter 16 and 17. The people, out of jealousy, rebelled against Aaron as their high priest. To resolve the dispute, God commanded the people to take 12 sticks written with the names of the leader of each tribe and place them in the presence or before the ark overnight. The next day, Aaron's rod from the house of Levi had budded with blossoms and almonds, God confirming through this his choice of Aaron's household as the priestly line. And in Numbers 17 and verse 10, And the Lord said to Moses, Put back the staff of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign for the rebels, that you may make an end of their grumblings against me, lest they die. The staff reminded the Israelites that on one, more than one occasion, they were rejecting or rejectors of God's authority. Now, third, we have the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments. Now, God had chosen the Israelites as his special people, but for the Israelites to qualify or continue in that distinction, he had demanded one thing. They must obey his law, the Ten Commandments. It was a conditional covenant, as we've been seeing through our time in even Genesis. What is the difference in the covenants? We're told this in Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And in verse 8, the Israelites had said heartily, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. In response to God's covenant. But how did they fare in fulfilling their end of the contract? 
the Ten Commandments, the law of God. How, how did men fare in this? It was impossible for them to keep the Ten Commandments. They, they fared miserably. Over and over again, they violated God's holy law. And God made it clear to them the consequences of their sin by sending plagues, natural hazards, foreign armies upon them. The stone tablets in the ark were a reminder that the Israelites had rejected God's right standard of living daily after day after day after day. These three articles were preserved in the ark throughout Israel's history as an unpleasant, and I think we miss this. There's probably a part of you that's saying, I didn't know that about the ark. I didn't understand what the ark was intended, what it does. I, I have a more Indiana Jones view of it. And this is what God has said about these things. That it was, it was there as a reminder that inside the ark was a continual reminder of Israel's inability to do what they had covenanted to do according to God's commands. They were an unpleasant symbol of man's sins and shortcomings, a reminder of how man rejected God's provision, authority, and right standard of living. In other words, it pointed to man as a helpless sinner, an incapable sinner. I've given you these things. You have said that you shall do them, and yet you don't, and yet you don't. Now, the second item is what was on top of the Ark of the Covenant, what we know as the Bema or the mercy seat. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 5. And above it, being the Ark of the Covenant, were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. The mercy seat, or what some have called the atonement cover, was simply the lid over the Ark. And on top of it stood two cherubim, two angels at the two ends that were facing each other. We have a pretty clear descriptive picture. The cherubim were symbols of God's divine presence and power. And they were facing downward toward the ark with outstretched wings that covered the atonement cover. The whole structure was beaten out of one piece of pure gold. And when the priest entered, the very first thing he would do is he sprinkled blood over the seat. So that when, when holy God and his Shekinah glory came in and looked down upon the sin of the people represented by the three things inside the ark, his judgment and his holiness held ready was held back. Because of the sprinkling of, of blood upon what was the mercy seat. Inside the ark, man's rebellion, man's sin, man's inability. Holy God's judgment but the mercy seat between. The third element that is contained in this is, is one we've already mentioned. It's the blood. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Hmm. Kind of puts God in a different light. It, it puts him at a point of reverence and fear that he is deserving of from his people. A recognition rightly of, of his seriousness and who he is. The reason for this shedding of blood, we're told in Leviticus 17, is that blood contains life. In blood there is life. There is a newness that is presented. We, we recognize this medically in many ways today. The loss of blood even through the smallest of incision, if enough blood leaves a person's body, life leaves that person's body. In the same way, in our blood, we have that which is able to fight infections and to restore and heal and bring newness. It's, it's an amazing recognition that we're coming to that our Creator fully knows well. In Leviticus 17 and verse 11, this is what we're told why blood is necessary. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. By God's design, this is how this is to be carried out. So what we see is the necessity, necessity of sacrifice or blood and the forgiveness of sins. And you say, well, why is that? Because God said, there are parts of this that are still a mystery. We might grow medically. Maybe we'll understand even more fully some truths about this if the Lord tarries another hundred years and we grow in our medical knowledge. Or maybe not. 
But there's no doubt the Lord has said these things. There's no doubt the Lord has commanded these things. There's no doubt the Lord's requirement is clear in these things. And we come to the final element of the sacrificial system, and that is the high priest. That's what we've been studying. They, there needed to be a high priest to carry this out. That there would be a man appointed from among men who would carry out these duties. That he would, and things pertaining to God, accomplish this. Hebrews chapter 7 verses 23 down to 28 speaks of this priesthood. The former priests on the one hand existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. The list of priests is great because one would die and another would have to take their place. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. A little glimpse into what we're going to be learning about the order of Melchizedek. Therefore, he is able also, able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those, other, like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sin and for them, then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. So wrapping this up, pic picture this scene together with me. We have the people continually sinning. If you read the Old Testament, you are confronted with this. Israel, the people of God, the covenantal people of God continually. God's presence is visible. Having led them out of Egypt, he's giving the Ten Commandments to Moses. And Aaron and the rest of them are down there building a golden calf. Right, the grumbling and, and complaining and the, 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 the manna is not sufficient and we would have been better off left. And the continual as they went into the promised land, finally in the next generation, the, the faith that was small and weak and lacking that led them astray continually to the worship of other gods who are not gods at all. You cannot read the Old Testament and not see this pattern of God's people. And so that's what we see. People continually sinning. And because of the sacrificial system, continually being reminded of their sin by having to take life and kill it as a sacrifice for their sin. <laughs> it's a brutal and sobering reminder, isn't it? Of the true cost of sin. We're, we're far removed from this. Can you imagine teaching your children under this system? You lied to mommy. We're going to take this lamb. Because of your sin and, and we're going to take it and it's going to die. Because you have chosen disobedience. C can you imagine the, the, the picture of that in a child? How that would be embedded in their understanding and recognition. It was, it was a brutal and sobering reminder of what is the true cost of sin. We are deeply sanitized from it. We are far removed from this. God looking down upon his throne, the, the ark, and his people. He saw in the ark only the broken commandments, the unholiness of his people. He and his holiness were told stores up wrath to be poured out upon those who are unrighteous. That he cannot not punish sin or else he would cease to be holy. And so looking upon his people, he sees their continual shortcomings and sin and rebellion and rejection and grumbling and complaining and testing in all things. But between his throne and the broken commandments and sins of the people was the mercy seat. It was given by him specifically where, where blood signifying life was sprinkled over the sins which the ark contained in representation. And because of this, he held back his wrath. And he held back his wrath. We're told in Romans 3 that this was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Now he didn't pass over them in the sense that he swept them under the rug and looked the other way. No, he held back his wrath due to the blood that was sacrificed according to his commands. In obedience to these things, he held it back. Generation after generation after generation, he held back the wrath, the judgment that was deserved until the day that he poured it out. 
until the Christ, the cross of Christ, where he let that wrath go. Verse 22 to 25 of Romans 3, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How much wrath? All of it. All of it for those who are being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. The Old Testament stands pointing to him whom we have received. The, the ark is not obsolete. It is a sign marker, a historical marker that we look back upon, preserved for us by God's providence in his word that we might see these things and be even tonight renewed in our thankfulness unto Christ. Hebrews 10 verses 1 to 10. If you will turn there, we're, we're wrapping up and I want to read this. I'm so excited to, to give a preview of all that awaits us in, in the coming weeks and months ahead in our study of the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> and you're already hearing some of the answers to the questions that chapter 5 may have sparked in you. Listen to this beginning in verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 10. For the law... Since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered, because the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them which are offered according to the law, then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this, by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Amen. Amen. It doesn't carry the weight for us if we don't understand what we have been rescued from. If we don't understand what would be the requirement if it was not for the fulfillment of that requirement. And so we see one necessity of the sacrifice was because of man's sin so that he might be reminded of it continually. It is not wrong for our sins to be before our eyes. It is not wrong for us to be, we don't want to sweep them under the rug. We don't want to put them in such a way that we're not recognizing that we are sinners. That the grace of God, as much as it has redeemed us, was still undeserved by us. Because the cross is a reminder of God's provision. So that in remembrance of him, we are able to express our thanksgiving. If you don't realize that you are a sinner who is incapable in your own strength and according to your own ability to redeem yourself before a holy and righteous God, then why would you ever sing Amazing Grace? Why would you ever be thankful? You see, the two come together part and parcel. The two go hand in hand. For that which we have been saved from is necessary for us to rejoice in our salvation. So also should our remembrance accomplish this in our lives tonight. That we might examine ourselves. In our salvation. In God's forgiveness of our sins. In our remembrance of his accomplishment of that. We are commanded to examine ourselves. To lay aside the sin for which he has died. To examine and find that which is not in accordance with God. That which is sinful. We're to, we're to examine our own internal, external lives as only we as individuals can do. And in finding those things, we then also in remembrance of Christ look at that sin for which he died on our behalf. And we turn loose of it. 
How can we hold on to that for which he died in the face of remembering his very death for those things? Our time tonight is symbolic. Hey, there's nothing uh, special in the crackers or the juice. They do not become the body nor the blood in some mysterious way. They're symbolic so that we might in our hearts be reminded through the symbolism, through the remembrance, through the time together of this finished sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That we might rejoice in what has been accomplished and needs not be accomplished ever again. For in its sufficiency, it is once for all. But the symbol requires the remembrance. And the remembrance requires the symbol. It brings it before us. And this we shall do. If we are members of the new covenant, we must remember it is because of the bloody sacrifice of Christ upon the cross that we have the promise of the new covenant. As we go to this time together, I call you to even now examine, to purify. How do you purify? If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In examination, we know it's generally right before us. We might have justified. We might have in ugly, stiff nakedness bowed our necks against what we know to be God's demanded will of our lives. But we know, even now this evening, you know the areas of your life that are out of alignment with God's good will and provision for you. And as we take this time in preparation for communion and through communion, remembrance of his body sacrificed on behalf of us, would we even now lay aside those things which are sinful, putting them before Christ, confessing them before the Lord with the desire not only of forgiveness, but with the recognition that he who forgives also cleanses. He will do that work and remove this hindrance and entanglement from you. Would we do so together, even tonight? Would you pray with me? Lord, <laughs> we are so removed. We have so sanitized our lives in such a way that we don't have to think on these brutal realities that we can um, live in the comfort, in the sanitized version with the bright lights and the comfortable chairs. And Lord, these are not sinful things. But they are dangerous things. They are things which remove us from the realities of a brutal sacrifice, of a, of a crushed and broken Savior on our behalf. That the Lord of glory would lay down his glory and take on flesh. That that very flesh might be crushed, might be broken, might be uh, shed upon our behalf. And Lord, would we tonight be removed from all this comfort and all of these things that we might be pierced in our innermost with the realities of you crucified on our behalf? Would we, would we rejoice in thanksgiving that you have loved us so much that you did this thing, that you did not cast us aside in our rebellion and brokenness, but that you loved us even when we were yet sinners and, and that you made the way through your own life that we might follow after you and be with you where you are, that we might be your people that we might see you someday face to face. And in that day, we might know the fullness of what you have prepared for us, what we are to be. And may we rejoice in that promise, even as we await its fullness. Lord, may we live lives that reflect our faith or trust in your promises, even as we await their fulfillment. And would we even tonight do all of these things to the good of your people,